गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू वन मोर टॉपिक फॉर ऑटोलर इंजियोलॉजी और ई एन टी विच इज द कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ टाइटस मीडिया एंड मेस्टॉयडाइटिस सो अबाउट द इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ दिस वन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आफ्टर द एडवेंट ऑफ ऑल द एंटीबायोटिक्स एंड बेटर diagnostic uh, modalities are available simply like uh, imaging ct scan mris and things like this so uh, the incidence of uh, complications are on decline uh, nowadays the uh, complications are not so common so uh, of course there are factors like uh, Um, one of the very important factor nowadays is uh, immune status if the patient is immunodeficient or not or too young or too old people their immunity is compromised and uh, people who are of from poor social economic status so they they can play some role one more thing is of course like what kind of organism is causing the infection uh, for example um, streptococcus pneumonia is very virulent and uh, haemophilus influenza is also resistant to many drugs nowadays and things like this so simply there are factors which can cause infection so you can see like here talking about the introduction showing you what are the different bones which are occupying the mastoid or the middle ear zygomatic process and styloid process there is premastoid and there is squamous bone so uh simply basically mastoid process when we see it from inside it is uh, uh, what you can say it have air cells or honeycomb appearances there like this you can see over here so again like they are showing you the tympanic cavity and the its communication with the mastoid air cells and this is the mastoid process which you can feel behind your ear easily and uh, of course there are muscles which are attached to this uh, this part you can see over here these are the name of the muscles and they are showing the attachments of the, those muscles so um like whenever we get otitis media as i told you before we can get mastoiditis or the inflammation of the mastoid or there could be collection of the pus in the middle ear as well as in the mastoid area so most commonly you know it is the suppurative infections suppurative infections you know which uh, uh which suppuration means like the pus forming infections right so like which can extend to the mastoid ear cells or which can damage the middle ear so how we classify mastoiditis like we have discussed this thing in the previous lecture like it could be acute and it could be chronic acute or classic mastoiditis is the complication of acute otitis media and chronic or latent or mass mastoiditis is present in uh, chronic patients and i told you told you one of the condition is cholesteatoma which is a wrong epithelium at the wrong place uh, now uh, when we divide uh, classify the complications of otitis media or mastoiditis you can say and mastoiditis uh, basically we can classify in two categories intratemporal uh, simply it is confined to the temporal bone and intracranial so uh, of course like intratemporal complications which are confined to the bone are basically uh, the complications which occur due to direct invasion of the bone it will cause ostitis like the inflammation of the bone uh, now the important thing over here is 
how it reaches to the brain. Mastoid and you know middle ear, it is like very closely placed to the brain. And simply there are veins uh, <clears throat> which are connected with the dural veins and which is in turn connected with the dural venous sinuses or the superficial veins of the brain. So that's the reason like the infection from the mastoid or the otitis media uh, can cause thrombophilobitis of the venous sinuses and uh, they can spread intracranially as well. Or there could be, for example, some of the um, complications like uh, or uh, malformations like uh, bony facial canal uh, or like uh, some sutures which are not closed properly or for example someone have skull fracture or surgical uh, procedures and things like this. So simply uh, as we know that uh, we will discuss all of these and intratemporal like only the bone it will be limited to the bone and intracranial is like whenever like it, it reaches the brain or inside the cranial cavity. So the presentation of uh, after otitis media uh, or what you can say what can be the last thing which can happen to the otitis media patients is like there could be a perforated tympanic membrane, the bones of the middle ear can become eroded, there could be atelectasis and adhesive otitis media, there could be tympanosclerosis like this, sclerosis is like fibrosis simply, there could be cholesteatoma, there could be of course, when the bones are destroyed, so there will be conductive hearing loss. Our next topic will be about this one. Sensory neural hearing loss, like when the nerve is damaged or the cochlea and all the structures are damaged. Um, of course, when in babies, you know, they have conductive hearing loss or hearing loss, they cannot develop speech properly and learning disabilities can be there, of course, in babies. So, of course, like these two are as the result of hearing loss. I told you like you know the incidence is decreasing so I am not going to talk more about epidemiology. So now uh, you can see like I am going to follow the same thing and this slide actually is done by that uh, ENT book Dhingra. So uh, acute mastoiditis. So this is the mastoid you can see the red dust in this ba patient right in the baby so simply um, it is the inflammation of the mastoid air cells or the bones which is inside right it is an inflammation of that we call it as mastoiditis uh, now uh, the thing is uh, uh, um, because like there is the inflammation of the bone so of course you know this area become tender and uh, uh, the, the babies or the patient they will feel pain and when you are going to touch it of course they will be having uh, tenderness and uh, the constitutional symptoms which are there like fever and all this thing, fever malaise and all these things you know they will be there so mastoiditis is more common in young children okay and uh, most of the time you know it is uh, uh, beta hemolytic streptococcus organism which causes mastoiditis it could be others so simply there is collection of pus over here and due to this collection of pus what will happen like the, the baby they have pain and all these things so uh, infective organisms and uh, this is see how acute mastoiditis it presents. What will be the symptoms? Again, pain will be one of the symptoms as well as fever. We can see the discharge. We can, on examination, you can have found mastoid tenderness. Uh, you can found uh, perforation again. And uh, the patient may have hearing loss. Okay. So now, of course, to <coughs> this is a presentation of chronic mastoiditis. Of course, like in this one, this the clinical features are subtle. They're not prone, more pronounced like acute one, and they have 
recurrent episodes of pain in ear as well as pain behind the ear. Recurrent headaches, febrile episodes and tympanic membrane may appear infected or posterior superior retraction with perforation of uh, with the pus. So basically, you know, uh, retraction with perforation is what like usually these perforations are in part pars tensa and uh, sometimes the perforation is so small that you know it's hard to catch by the way so of course like whenever there is any infection in the body guys we go for cbc we can do esr we can do blood cultures we can take the swab from the ear we can do a CT scan and uh, we can do a lumbar puncture if we are suspecting that there is uh, intracranial spread and once you have managed this thing we will do audiogram to check for um, any deafness which is there so now the management is simply uh, we give the patient antibiotics, broad spectrum one, and oral antibiotics are given, antipyretic and meningotomy with groom insertion. We have discussed this thing, right? Uh, now, guys, uh, whenever anyone have this, uh, this one, of course, like it is painful, and uh, uh, one of the complication of mastoiditis is again what you can say. Uh, uh, you can say like pus formation right so per subperiosteal pus can be formed and all this stuff so of course like in that case we go for surgery and what we do is basically cortical mastoidectomy so see mastoidectomy in there like they have this is external ear canal and this is the entrum like they they had taken out all the things you know which are inside so now the important point over here is that uh, uh, what you can say there can be direct extension to the demineralized bone seen in the cholecystiatoma or there could be hematogenous spread via veins there could be spread through the round or old window and uh, there could be dehiscence of bone covering over the jugular bulb or the tegment tympani and there could be neoplastic like cancer or accidental bony erosion and there could be a surgical defect in post stepidectomy patient in which like the infection can spread and what happened uh, again it's an intratemporal uh, complication which can be seen in these patients as uh, what you can say it is um, coalescent mastoiditis right um, the important part in here is what like uh, when mastoid region inflammation cannot be arrested, so suppression under pressure causes local acidosis and osseous calcific decalcification, ischemia, and osteoclastic dissolution of the pneumatic cell wall. So simply, all the mastoid area can get destroyed. You can see over here, here or here, right? These are basically small, small arrows. I don't know. I can make it big just to show you guys. So you can see like these arrows on the CT scan. We can see like all this bony erosion is going on, right? So this is how it presents. So simply it will become a large cavity and there will be exudate inside this one and uh, uh, it can result into empyema. Empyema is what collection of the pus. So <laughs> this is like that's why we go for CT scan and we see what's going on. So um, again like uh, when this thing happens you know uh, now it can spread anteriorly to the middle ear via editus and antrum and can result into tympanic membrane mem membrane perforation it can spread laterally and produce subperiosteal abscess it can spread medially to petrous air air cells causing petrocytus and of course we use ct scan to do that uh, there is something called as latent mastoiditis, like subclinical mastoiditis or mass mastoiditis. And this one, of course, like 
uh, the temporal bone infection is there but very few clinical symptoms and uh, most of the people you know when they have <clears throat> mastoiditis <coughs> or middle ear infection what happens is um, simply they use antibiotics which are not sufficient to um, cover the infection completely so that's why they have this latent mastoiditis or fast mastoid mast mastoiditis so there is higher risk like you know this one can erode the bones and can cause intracranial complications now guys different abscesses can form when the infection will reach to the subperiosteal area now again i will show you the that one you know see mastoiditis petrocytis facial paralysis and labyrinthitis so now what happens is like when there is decalcification of the outer mastoid cortical bone it results in abscess that can extend downwards towards the external auditory canal it can spread along the zygomatic bone it can spread to the post auricular region so this is a photograph of post auricular abscess and this is the most common place where mastoid abscess can form so you can see like his or her pinna is displaced okay so the pinna is displaced forwards outwards and downwards okay so uh, this is the most common place where the abscess can form it is called as what post auricular behind the ear you can see the zygomatic abscess so when it spreads along the zygomatic bone it can cause swelling which will appear in front okay so this is zygomatic abscess and one of the thing which can occur is uh, wait wait i think i don't have the photograph of that like uh, that is called as bezold abscess so bezold abscess can be formed as well so uh, basically this is the abscess which lie um, deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle so it push the sternocleidomastoid muscles outward or muscle outward if it is unilateral so that is called as bezold abscess so this is how this abscesses are formed and remember guys whenever there is formation of abscess in any patient the only treatment is drainage there are others as well one thing is called as uh, wait i'm going to show you now um, wait i don't know if it's given yeah there is one more so bezold abscess can be there there is one more abscess called as sitelis abscess it is along the posterior belly of digastric okay so simply this is the abscess which is formed behind the mastoid okay and more towards the occipital bone so basically the abscess is considered to be a abscess of digast digastric triangle then there is lux abscess the other name is meatal abscess this is along the posterior wall of the auditory external auditory canal so simply uh, this bus pass can be can get open into the external auditory canal and the discharge will come from the external auditory canal 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 and there could be parapharyngeal and retropharyngeal abscesses so of course like these are all the type of abscesses which can form okay so now you can see over here peri sinus abscess this one or this pointers you know or this pointer or this pointer is showing you peri sinus abscess 
Okay, then there is petrocytus. So now what is petrocytus? You know, there is petrous part of temporal bone. So this is basically inflammation of petrous part of temporal bone. That's why it is called as petrocytus. So simply when the infection spread from the middle ear and mastoid to the petrous part of temporal bone, it is called as petrocytus. Okay. Now, um, the petrous part of the temporal bone, I show you in the start, how it looks like. It also have air cells. Okay. So, that's why, you know, like, it have, or you can say, the, almost the same involvement like uh, mastoiditis. My, like a classical presentation of uh, petrocytus is called as Gradingo syndrome. So what is Gradingo syndrome? It is basically a triad of external rectus paralysis. Uh, now, what is the external rectus paralysis? It is basically the extraocular muscle you can see over here is lateral rectus, LR6, which is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. So simply they have the palsy of sixth cranial nerve with deep facial pain. And the fa pa facial pain is basically retroorbital, like behind the orbit, behind the eyeball. And ipsilateral atoria or you can say Tori as what discharged from the ear. Okay, so these three triads, the like these three things are there. So you can see over here he have the six nerve palsy, or you can say his lateral rectus is gone. See his eyes pointing over here. So this muscle is weak. LR6, lateral rectus supplied by the six trainer nerve. <laughs> so Basically, these patients, they present with persistent ear discharge uh, and uh, fever, headache, vomiting, you know, they are also the features, sometimes with neck rigidity, okay, sometimes with neck rigidity. So, the abducens nerve, abducens nerve is a sixth nerve, it involve, involvement occurs at its course through the Dorilo canal. That is the area which get inflamed. And of course, CT scan will show you the changes of the pretrus attracts with uh, when we go for CT or MRI. Okay, so CT or MRI can be done and it will, it will show us like how it looks like. So again, like these are the CTs or MRIs they are showing about pretrocytes as you can see over here, right? So how we treat pretrocytes is simply they go for cortical or modified radical mastoidectomy okay so that is the only thing they, they have to do the other type of complications or the extracranial complications you can say extracranial or intratemporal complications is labyrinthitis so if you know what is labyrinthitis you know labyrinthitis is the structure inside the inner ear and uh, simply it is the inflammation of that labyrinth so, uh, it has three types. I'm not interested in going into detail because that one is not required, by the way. But it can be circumcised, circumscribed labyrinthitis or diffuse serous labyrinthitis or diffuse separative labyrinthitis. Separative means what? Purse forming. And uh, simply, uh, what is the function of labyrinth? Labyrinth, you know, deals with the balance maintained. So simply, when the when there is labyrinthitis, so the patient they present with vertigo, vertigo. Okay, so this is how labyrinthitis present, and uh, of course, like the treatment is to give antibiotics with anti-inflammatory drugs because this is it is labyrinthitis, so we have to uh, treat that. 
Uh, one of the complication is seventh nerve palsy. Now, uh, our last lecture will be about seventh cranial nerve. So, in all that lecture, what we are going to discuss is the seventh cranial nerve. <laughs> Remember, guys, that uh, uh, seventh cranial nerve is related with the middle ear. Uh, though it is well protected in a bony canal, but uh, simply when the bone canal get uh, any inflammation, this nerve can be damaged and the patient can present with seventh cranial nerve palsy or facial nerve palsy, you can say, right? So, sensorineural hearing loss uh, uh, is more common in chronic otitis media with cholesteatoma. Like, of course, sensory one is like when there is some problem with the nerves. Okay, so this thing. Uh, now, you know, uh, the important things are intracranial uh, complications. So, uh, intracranial complications, of course, like the brain is involved in, so of course, like they are, you can say, uh, the most feared or the most dangerous one. So, uh, the first one over it, written over here is called as epidural abscess, right? So, epidural abscess and then you can see there could be a dural venous thrombophalibitis. Uh, by the way, that is uh, the abscess can be extradural or subdural. So, meningitis or brain abscess can form. Lateral sinus thrombophalibitis can be there or otitic otitic hydrocephalus can be there. So, epidural abscess is the most common intracranial complication it's, and it simply it spreads when there is bone destruction and now the infection is inside the cranial cavity and the posterior cranial fossa is the most commonly one involved. So, extra dural is simply, you know, when there is collection of the pus between the bone and the dura. Okay. So, uh, this one is epidural. So, uh, simply what happens like uh, due to osseous destruction in the Trotman triangle over the sigmoid sinus plate or in the posterior cortex of Petrus pyramid. Um, CT is mandatory for diagnosis, of course, like CT scan will tell us or show us the collection of pus in in these patients, okay, and that's how uh, it can be easily, uh, what you can say, diagnosed. So, uh, <clears throat> whenever anyone have like extra dural, epidural or subdural, abscess simply uh, what happens like you know maybe in the start they will be asymptomatic but you know as it will co co start causing pressure inside the brain so the patient may present with severe pain in the ear with persistent headaches um, fever uh, ear discharge and uh, maybe focal neurological signs and of course, like uh, guys, remember this thing uh, that whenever there is abscess collection in any part of the body except the anterior chamber of the eye, we have to drain it, right? So it's like this that, you know, uh, first of all, we have to evacuate that uh, pus and after evacuation, we have to provide them with antibiotics. And subdural will be like a, the collection of the pus will be between in the dura and the subarachnoid matter. And remember, this one will cause more meningeal irritation. So, the patient will be presenting with the uh, signs and symptoms of meningitis like fever, headache, uh, neck stiffness, and Kernig and Brudzinski signs will be positive. Okay, so all these things can be there. So, simply, uh, the concept goes like this way that the abscess can be extradural, can be epidural, can be subdural, and uh, it can lead to meningitis, okay? It can lead to meningitis. So, of course, like when the infection is in contact with the meninges and the meninges get inflamed, we call the condition as meningitis. And uh, meningitis, like if you, you, you have already covered what is meningitis, so 
the things will be easy for you and you know the signs and symptoms of meningitis and how we um, treat um, meningitis right um, and of course like when the infection is going to reach inside the brain we call it as intracranial abscess right so depending on the location of the pus it could be extradural it could be subdural it could be intracranial and remember when the um, meninges are uh, irritated or infected or inflamed we call it as meningitis and when the brain tissue become infected or irritated or inflamed we call it as encephalitis so of course like all these things can occur uh, one of the complication which can occur you know due to um, these abscesses is like again the veins uh, can which are draining these areas they can go into thrombus formation or what we call, call it as thrombophalibitis okay so uh, dural venous thrombophalibitis can occur dural venous thrombophalibitis can occur the, these patients so uh, it is like mostly as a result from extradural abscess and sigmoid sinus thrombosis as a protective mechanism in attempt to localize the infection of course the body immune system you know it, it like it is trying to localize the infection in that area not letting it to spread to all of the body and now this thrombus may can enter into the jugular vein and to the other sinuses and through the emissary veins to the subcutaneous tissue so now the diagnosis in dural venous thrombophalibitis can be tricky or difficult because the patients can be completely asymptomatic or some of the patients they may have intracranial hypertension or hydrocephalus and of course we will go for mastoidectomy with surgical exposure of the dura and removal of the abscess with the granulation tissue and with after that we can put the patient on antibiotics with um, in this case anticoagulation because we don't want more coagulation to happen in this area you can see like here they are showing you how dural venous thrombophalibitis looks like right so this one subdural empyma we have discussed this thing right so this is the subdural empyma you can see over here or here okay seen on on the imagings Okay, so other intracranial complications could be meningitis, hydrocephalus, encephalitis. I, I discussed all these things, parenchymal, cerebellar, or cerebral or cerebellar abscesses, or simply you can say intra uh, uh, brain paren parenchymal abscesses, right? Now they are in the uh, brain parenchyma, right? And all these things can occur. Okay, carotid artery involvement can be there, but nowadays, you know, anti, anti antibiotic, we are living in antibiotic era, so that's why it is not so common. Okay, uh, but whenever it occurs, you know, internal carotid artery is more likely to be involved, and uh, simply like uh, that, that is going to cause a bigger damage. So uh, many other things can occur. For example, one of the things is called as lateral uh, sinus. Uh, uh thrombophalibitis thrombophalibitis phalibitis uh, okay so little sinus thrombophalibitis uh, so like simply it is you can say the inflammation of the lateral venous sinus which which is, will cause thrombophalibitis over there right and uh, again it can occur in uh, as a complication of mastoiditis and uh, like uh, the clinical features in these uh, in literal sinus thrombophalibitis are um, too many uh, because uh, uh, what happens in these patients like one someone anyone have literal sinus thrombophalibitis uh, what occur is like uh, of course they will be having constitutional symptoms like fever uh, malaise okay um, headache of course uh, will be one of the feature um, so uh, one of the thing you know which the, the occur in these patients like who have little sinus or any sinus thrombophalibitis is intracranial um, hypertension okay uh, like the pressure 
uh, in the brain get increased and uh, because of this of course like because of intracranial hypertension you know uh, there are other features of course like uh, headache can be secondary to this thing as well and uh, uh, one of the thing uh, what you can say in these patients is um, there could be edema um, over uh, edema over posterior part of uh, mastoid. Uh, this is there is a name for this sign which is called as uh, Grisinger sign, but like not important to remember. Uh, so uh, again, one more thing which can occur is called as papilloedema. Papillo. Uh, papilloedema can occur in these patients. So uh, all the things can occur. There are uh, different tests, but they are not important to remember. So I'm not talking about them. Uh, but uh, of course, like in these patients, uh, well, what we go for is we go for CT scans. Okay. And the CT scans, they show a delta sign in these patients. Okay. Uh, MRI can be done as well for these patients. So this thing can occur. And yes, the last thing which we have to discuss in this one is uh, um, otitic hydrocephalus. Okay, so uh, like uh, now, what is hydrocephalus? You know, um, hydro means water, right? Cephalus means brain. So basically, it is uh, raised intracranial pressure with normal CSF findings okay so this is like uh, uh, one of the complication of this uh, middle ear infections or you can say mastoiditis so uh, what happens is basically uh, when the patients they have lateral sinus thrombosis okay uh, there is what you can say there is obstruction to the venous return and uh, once the thrombosis it extend to the superior sagittal sinus if you know the anatomy of the brain you know you can know like what is the location of the superior sagittal sinus so what happens basically um, the arachnoid villi which are there to absorb csf now they cannot do this function so simply there will be raised intracranial pressure and when you will do the um, csf culture what you will found like there is there will be nothing so the patients like how they present they present with headache uh, they present with uh, um, diplopia uh, now uh, why diplopia because you know uh, there is a pressure on the sixth cranial nerve okay and that's the why you know the lateral rectus it, it is not working fine so there will be um, papillo edema on examination as well as blurring of vision can be there okay so all the things will be there uh, by the way the I have seen a patient of this one uh, not autotic hydrocephalus but uh, uh, I have seen a patient of lateral sinus thrombosis and uh, like uh, it's very it's not so easy to diagnose like this condition because uh, you have to rule out a lot of a lot, lot of other things so uh, simply uh, the diagnostics is simply uh, how we measure the raised intracranial pressure you know to measure the raised intracranial pressure we go for uh, lumbar puncture okay so uh, what they do like they they do lumbar puncture and then they see like what is the pressure of the csf okay so the normal pressure of the csf is between 70 to 120 millimeter of water but uh, uh, the like on lumbar puncture when they have the pressure um, is more than uh, 300 uh, millimeter of uh, H2O um, <laughs> you know it is called as okay so H2O okay so it is like considered as hydrocephalus uh, so how how they treat this kind of condition anyone who have uh, autotic hydrocephalus so uh, we have to reduce the CSF pressure right because if the CSF pressure will not be reduced so all these features will be there diplopia, papilloedema, all the things will be there 
So, uh, what, like what they do, like they put the patients on acetazolamide, and uh, which is a diuretic, and uh, um, corticosteroids. Okay, uh, corticosteroids are given to the patients. Um, and what, like one of the things they do is like keep, they keep on doing repeated um, lumbar puncture. Uh, what you can say uh, to uh, take out fluid. Okay, so because you know arachnoid villi, they cannot. Uh, what you can say absorb the fluid so they they drain the fluid repeated lumbar puncture draining can be done can be said okay and one of the thing of course like you know like the CSF is produced on daily basis and we cannot go for repeated lumbar puncture for so long so one of the surgery which could, could be done is called as lumbo peritoneal uh, shunt so what they do they uh, they make a shunting they shunt the csf inside the peritoneal cavity so whatever is the csf which is extra or which is formed you know it is drained in, into the peri peritoneal ca cavity why because in these patients you know the the arachnoid villi uh, which are there to absorb the csf they are not working so of course like the permanent solution is the uh, lumbo peritoneal shunting of the csf uh, okay not just these complications guys there is a lot of other complications uh, which can occur um, in these patients for example um, to tell you there could be tympano uh, sorry not tympano yes uh, there could be sclerosis of the bones um, or the sclerosis of uh, stapes for example with the oval window so of course there could be many other complications but uh, these are few of the complications which can occur um, in these patients so uh, we had discussed mastoiditis in the previous lecture today we had discussed what is petrocytis and here like they have shown you the petrocytis the brain abscess a very left drop diagram facial paralysis little sinus thrombosis subdural abscess or um, extradural abscess um, like here they are again showing you the bones how it looks like okay uh, what is Petra's part of temporal bone and all these things. So simply, um, we had discussed mastoid mastoiditis, we had discussed petrocytis, and facial paralysis we will discuss in one complete lecture. Labyrinthitis, I told you, inflammation of the labyrinth and it is the one which, which, which deal with the balance. So um, simply, there will be the symptoms of balance or vertigo will be there. Exodural abscess, subdural abscess, uh, remember both of these or brain abscess right uh, three of these are abscesses uh, <coughs> one of the complication of petrocytosis is abscesses as well like I show you bezold abscess or post auricular abscess and all these abscesses so as I told you uh, the general rule whenever there is abscess in the body uh, we have to do a surgical drainage what it is called as incision and drainage so they give an incision they take out the collection of the pus and once they have done that, uh, what they do, like uh, uh, they put on it on, like they put the patient on the antibiotics and the, the abscess fluid, which is drained, they send it to the labs to check like uh, for culture and sensitivity, uh, simply uh, to see what kind of organism is there. Either it's like, and what kind of organism is there, number one, and to which antibiotics, you know, uh, which kind of antibiotics are active against that, that organism. So, of course, like, uh, first of all, uh, we put the patients on, um, you can say, um, empiric therapy, okay, but once the, our, the results are back and we know, okay, uh, this kind of organism is the one which is affecting the patient, so we tailor the antibiotic according to that report. So, the culture and sensitivity report, you know, it gives us uh, what kind of organism is there with what antibiotics are acting against them. And meningitis will be treated as we treat the meningitis, right? Uh, the clinical features we all know. Kernick sign, Brzezinski signs, or um, head jolt accentuation of the headache. Uh, by the way, meningitis, you know, we discussed in neurology as well. And I told you what is lateral sinus thrombophilobitis, right? Or um, sagittal sinus thrombophilobitis. Like simply, there's the thrombus formation inside with the inflammation of the uh, that venous sinus so it is phalibitis is the inflammation of the wall of the sinus and thrombo is like there is thrombus formation so this thing and otitic hydrocephalus 
uh, again i explain this one so that's all for, uh, guys for uh, uh, this week about end and uh, 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 i'm going to we are going to see uh, just after this two lectures of ENT are left, like one is about facial nerve and uh, in one lecture we are going to discuss with, uh, by the way, let me check uh, what kind of uh, lectures are left about ENT because maybe like I will wind, up, wind them up. So our next lecture will be about sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus and the last lecture is about um, giddiness, Meniere's disease, Meniere's disease and facial paralysis and that's also after this just two lectures are left and then of course uh, our ENT will be done as well so thank you so much guys for listening and I will see you next week in auto geology lecture